So I am going to be talking to you all about um, a paper that stems from my broader dissertation project. Um, so I just finished up in July, and so I'm still putting out work from my dissertation research. Um, and so I'm actually going to start this talk just a little differently than I normally start research talks. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I came to this work and came to study um, reentry and incarceration. Um, and this is going to include sort of my personal experiences, my background, right, my commitment to community engagement, um, and you all will see some of that. And then also um, my engagement with obviously research and prior um, works in this area. And then I'm going to discuss my new article in criminology called Damned If You Do, Damned If You Don't, um, which highlights this idea of the prison credential dilemma um, and I will walk us through that um, using the narratives of formerly incarcerated men trying to find work with um, these program certificates um, and other work experiences from prison. And then I'm going to end with implications of this work for policy and practice, and also with a little bit of self-reflection. Um, I've been doing more of that as um, this project and, and the other projects from my dissertation has developed, have developed. So I'm gonna first start with a little bit about my background. So I actually grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so I lived in Columbus, Ohio all my life up until I came here. Um, I grew up on the Southeast side of Columbus. Um, and it was a predominantly black working class neighborhood um, essentially plagued by some of the same things that I study. So if we look at this map, the darker the red, the higher the crime rates. Um, and so we dealt with over-policing, we dealt with violence, we dealt with um, incarceration and so on and so forth. And in fact, if you plug in my zip code into this crimegrade.org, um, you would see that we got a pretty much a failing um, crime rate. And um, so actually this is looking at Google Maps, um, my aunt's house um, and my mom. So my mom was a sort of single mom. And so me and my brother would go to my aunt's house while my mom was at work. And then she would come pick us up. So our bus would, um, from school, will let out at my aunt's house in this neighborhood. Um, during the summers, we would spend all day there. Um, so I grew up around like, all my cousins. I was the only girl and I was also the youngest. Um, growing up around a bunch of black boys. So this is my brother and then my older cousin. He was the oldest out of all of us, um, Anthony. And then obviously these are some of the um, same folks in different photos, but there were many other cousins as well. Um, so I, Anthony actually lived in this neighborhood. So I was fortunate enough still, you know, at the end of the day, after my mom picked me up to go to a different neighborhood. It wasn't too much better off than um, my aunt's neighborhood, but I still had some sort of separation from that environment, um, but my cousin Anthony obviously lived there, right? He was embedded at, in that environment. And so he um, ended up catching a charge in 2003 and it was for um, concealed weapon. Actually, all this stuff is public information. So you can pull up um, anyone with a criminal record. Um, they're basically every single thing they've ever been charged for. I've obviously anonymized some stuff. And so that just sort of sparked the cyclical nature. So you can see from 2003, some of these are traffic offenses um, in which other charges um, arrive from those, those stops. Um, but you can just sort of see the cyclical nature um, and how he got caught up in the criminal justice system. The other ones were more like drug distribution or drug possession and so on and so forth. Um, but this sort of um, impacted my family because now we know more about sort of fines and fees and bail. There's more attention toward that. Um, but at the time that was not sort of um, well talked about in policy arenas, but this impacted my family for that, for that reason. So I remember conversations with, um, between my mom and my aunt about um, having to come up with bail, having to um, come up with like fines and fees to leave, you know, make sure that he was able to get out. Um, and so, that impacted us. Obviously, we weren't economically well off, um, but that impacted our family a lot. It wasn't just sort of him, it was also how it impacted us. But all of this 
was occurring before I really had the framework to understand like, what was going on around me, right? It was before I knew that my family, my Anthony's experiences weren't an anomaly, right? These were sort of common things that were occurring in um, and across the US, right? It was before I knew that we incarcerated the most disadvantaged populations. Um, and we solved a lot of our problems, quote unquote, solved via the carceral system, right? It was before I knew that Black people were in prison six times the rate of white folks and a little less times the rate of Latinx and Hispanic folks. And it was also before I knew that not having a high school diploma, something um, that seems so sort of common nature by now, um, could put you at higher risk of being incarcerated. And then it was also before I knew that 45% of other families in the US had experienced um, a family member um, being incarcerated and that 63% of black Americans um, experienced those, those same issues. And so as I was so privileged to end up going to college um, and learning more and more about these issues, I really came to enjoy and, and, and um, was drawn to this work and research um, because I was looking for a way to understand and make sense of these, these patterns and the things that I was learning um, in my degree. And so I think Bell Hooks and her um, opening of theory as liberatory practice really um, encapsulate that. She, she does this really well. She says, let me begin by saying that I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp, um, sorry, <laughs> to grasp what was happening around and within me. Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. I saw in theory then a location for healing, right? So I wanted to understand how someone, right? I knew Anthony personally, how, how someone and other, many other people in my community um, could end up going down this path? What sort of social conditions, um, what sort of structural barriers constrained or enabled their ability to sort of um, realize their potential? Um, and so I wanted to really move away from this sort of thinking where this tweet says, you know, oh, you're experiencing a structural problem. Have you ever considered trying different personal choices, right? I feel like in my reading of the literature, um, we tend to focus on even things with like credentials is a way our solutions are um, embedded in this like individual deficit. Oh, it must be something that an individual does not have that is causing them um, to return to prison and so on and so forth. Focused on individuals um, and moving toward seeing structures, right? So this person says, please, I beg you all to see structures where you think you see a series of individual problems, right? I started to notice these patterns. Um, and then in pursuing sociology, I was able to then have that framework to understand that there are structures that constrain or enable certain people and their opportunities, the things that they can do, um, even before they get impacted by the criminal justice system. Um, and just because, right, when we think of structures, we think big, we think of policies, practices, we think pretty, pretty big level, right? But for me, um, that didn't mean that I couldn't continue engaging with these communities. That actually, for me, meant that I needed to, to understand how these larger sort of structures, everyday things that we sort of take for granted, were impacting like real people on the ground. Um, and so, as I entered graduate school, I made sure I stayed engaged with these communities, right? I obviously was not living in every day like I grew up. I, you know, went on to college and had different resources and um, abilities to sort of um, do this, but I still wanted to make sure I was staying engaged. And so I ended up participating in um, this program called Buckeye Reach, which um, is sort of like, uh, CPEP here, where you go into, we you know, did educational programming, we went into juvenile um, facilities, young men, and did educational programming. I did that for about three years. And then from there, I started branching out into reentry um, centers in the community, um, especially as my dissertation sort of developed during that period. Um, and so I think 
this work, right, my past experiences, my commitment to that sort of community engaged work um, helped me bring a different perspective to what we've been asking for centuries now, right? So like what works, right? What works, what can rehabilitate people? We've been asking the same questions since 1960s, this says 79, the original report 74, but there were lots of other reports coming out asking what works to rehabilitate people. And the dominant approach was via programming, via programming. Um, and so prison credentials, what I call them are just essentially these work and education programs, um, these certificates and other experiences that people get while they're incarcerated. So working a job theoretically could be a prison credential, a tangible certificate from a program could be um, a prison credential. I focus on work and education, um, the theoretically how they operate should be the same. So these have been proposed for many, many years as a way to alleviate a lot of the challenges that people have once they're released um, and enter, re-enter the labor market. Um, so they're theoretically supposed to signal desistance, which is essentially you're, you're not engaging in sort of criminal behavior or not um, reoffending or et cetera, and also job readiness. Um, suppose a signal to employers, hey, this person has the skill sets to be um, an asset and contribute to your, your company and so on and so forth. And even some of the very few um, surveys that we have that ask people incarcerated about why they even decided to pursue these programs. A lot of the times you don't have to go um, and, and pursue these programs, right? It's not, it's, it's optional besides a few that are mandated in certain states. Um, so a lot of these are really in line with what we would think, right? Like um, someone who's like doing better, desisting, who is like improving, right? Um, they say they wanna, they wanna participate for self-improvement. They wanna to participate to gain better skills and employment um, after their release and so on and so forth. However, what we know um, from all that research for, uh, over the last half century is that results are very mixed, right? The efficacy of these programs are mixed. So this is, I pull from a, a meta-analysis which just takes a bunch of different um, programs and they, have, they put them, lined them up and try to see what's the sort of net like effect. Is it a positive effect? Do these programs generally have um, a positive effect on employment outcomes? And so this line, if this, these bars cross the line, then that means there's no difference in employment outcomes between um, participants and non-participants. And then bars to the, the right of this line suggests that there's a positive effect. And so essentially all I want you to grasp from this uh, figure is that it's very mixed, mixed bag. Um, lots of null effects, some negative effects, which is not super common. Um, I'm assuming that's something with the design of that study. And then um, a, a decent amount of positive effects. And so there's this net positive effect, but it's about 13%, lots of mixed evidence. Why? So what are sort of the common narratives and um, research about why this evidence is so mixed. So some scholars say it's about low program fidelity. So essentially they're saying that these programs um, are, there's too much um, inconsistencies in the quality and how they're implemented. So they're, they're these original strategies and evidence-based um, strategies and implementation designs that aren't being implemented correctly. This is essentially the argument, right? Quality is varying. Other scholars say that um, it's some of the methodological limitations of prior work. Um, we've gotten a little bit better with um, models and, and doing uh, randomized controlled trials and all these other things um, recently, but largely our studies suffer, or suffer from like selection effects. So who gets selected into programs can influence then like that pool of folks are different in some ways that you can't measure from um, other folks. Um, and then that biases the effect sizes. Same thing, small sample sizes, attrition issues and so on and so forth. Um, and so what I do in this piece, the uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't, is I actually just 
ask the guys who've gone through the programs, um, who've gone through some programs qualitatively, um, how they done? like, how can you use these? Just very basic questions um, about their experiences um, using these credentials. And through these interviews, that's how I developed the idea of the prison credential dilemma. And so I'm actually gonna start with their narratives that I drew from um, to help explain it. And then I'll walk through more um, in depth. So I asked the guys um, how, like, like, do you think these credentials are helping you in the labor market when you're trying to find work? And so Charlie, one of my respondents said, yes, because a prison credential gives me the certification. It gives me that little piece of paper that employers want to see. And no, in the sense that I got involved while incarcerated. And so George also reiterates something similar to, to Charlie. He says, I think prison credentials could definitely be a plus, but I just don't wanna jump through the hoops of explaining why I was in there. I think the experience would be overshadowed by where I got it, right? So in, in his mind, he didn't even use credentials and he didn't even use them when he was out in the labor market because he was fearful that those were just essentially marked and indicate his incarceration record. And then Mark talks about something slightly different about the value, right? And so he says, a lot of employers are looking for people who are actually experienced or trained. So I don't see prison credentials as a negative, but they would probably think, well, his degree isn't as good as someone who earned a degree in society. And so what these guys are saying is that we tend to focus on the criminal record question, especially in policy, but there are many ways that you can signal that you've been incarcerated, especially um, through these credentials. And so routine job applications and interview questions that ask about past employers, that ask about your education history, your work history, where it is, the location, all of those details. Those are decisions, these guys have to make decisions about how they then um, signal and whether they, they signal and so on and so forth because many of the credentials um, are sort of tied to their time in prison. And so what the prison credential dilemma essentially highlights is that these may actually be perceived by some employers, sure, as these positive qualifications, right? Employers that probably are a bit more um, open in the first place to hiring people with criminal records. Um, but then by other employers, it just may be a signal, a negative signal, right? Either they may devalue their expertise that they've gotten while they're incarcerated without even knowing sort of what goes on in those programs and so on and so forth for the most part, or just as a way to screen out um, applicants, right? You see that it was acquired in prison, and then you just use that as a way to screen applicants out of the process. And so what this does, if I'm an applicant, it produces uncertainty. Now you have to decide, right? If I'm thinking this is how employers will think, you have to decide then, do you think that this employer is going to discriminate? You don't know how any given employer may. And then what that can do based on how they decide, right? That can influence their behaviors and strategies, right? Do they list it? Do they even use it, right? How do they use it? Um, do they use it differently at different parts of the, the um, job search process? Um, all of these factors are quantitative measures in this program evaluation research can't really account for, right? We don't even know if guys are using the credentials out in the labor market. So we can't really say, um, you know, one way or the other for sure, um, based on the sort of data that we have um, currently in use. And so, so I developed that and then I move on and I wanna know, okay, how do these guys deal with this, right? That has to be very complex. You, don't, you have no information in something as big as like a job, right? How do, you, how do you decide if you're gonna use them or not? Or like, what are your strategies? And so I, um, I asked them, you know, I wanted to know how they navigate the labor market given this prison credential dilemma. And then what strategies they tried to use to find work when you know, things didn't work out as intended. All right, and so these are all qualitative interviews and I skipped the data and methods. I'm happy to talk about those in the Q&A. I figured I'd give more time to, 
to their responses. Um, so the first thing that these guys did was use the semblance on job applications. So about 40% of the sample used the semblance on job applications. And essentially what this was, was they were omitting or omitting the uh, credential altogether or, or obscuring the institutional affiliation in certain ways. Um, and that was on their resumes or job applications. That way they were able to signal that they were employable, right? Without also signaling their criminal record. Um, especially on resumes when, when they're not even at the application, like they don't have to fill out an application. A lot of online places um, like uh, Indeed and things like that do it that way now. So Paul, um, he got a culinary uh, management. He did a culinary management program in prison. These guys did so many different programs. Um, I just listed ones that were kind of relevant uh, to the context. He also um, did work in the penal industry factory. And so when I asked him how he uses or lists these credentials, he said, if it's like construction job, I definitely put prison credential down. I make it sound a little better than Dodge Correctional. I call it Dodge County Contractors. I make some shit up. As long as I have the certificate to back up what I was calling it, right? And so he's saying that he's willing to kind of slightly tweak the name in order to get his foot in the door. Um, and then Nick also, I asked him sort of the same question and he was like, I'm not gonna put the prison down. No, we can talk about that once we interview. And I was like, well, why not? And he was like, just how a person perceives you, what it looks like when you're gonna have a prison written down. Now nah, we'll talk about that during the interview. And so these guys used the semblance on job application in order to um, sort of get to the next stage, right? They didn't really see it as anything wrong with it because they had the skills, right? And, you know, quite frankly, I, I agree. But like, um, they, they wanted to make sure they were able to get to the job interview stage. Then they can sort of contextualize um, their, their background alongside these um, credentials. And so in the interviews, they use these redemptive narratives and um, about 44%, well, 44% of respondents use these narratives. And essentially the prison credential then became a way, a tool, a tangible um, thing to demonstrate that they were employable, right? But also like change, they've changed their behavior. Um, and within these credentials were embedded within these redemptive narratives, trying to sort of demonstrate or perform remorse um, in front of employers. So Jeff was actually one respondent um, or one participant who did find a job with his credential after um, he was incarcerated. Um, and he still though needed to rely on these sort of tricks and um, strategies. He said, I first tried to steer the conversation away from the crime itself in the interview. It's more about what I had done with my time while I was there to try to eliminate these thought patterns and activities that would lead me to or want to commit crimes. I try to demonstrate that more than focusing on the crime and trying to explain why I've done it. And so I was like, okay, well, how, like, where do prison credentials come into the play here? And then he said, you know, that's a big part of the demonstration. And then he starts talking to me as if, you know, I'm an employer. He says, during my first um, year of incarceration, I got my GED. From there, I went on um, the masonry uh, apprenticeship. And then I got 1800 hours of barbering and went on to college. Then I went on to start helping others earn their GEDs, understanding math, English, social studies, and stuff like that, right? So he's using his credentials as a way, as this tangible way to demonstrate to employers, like, hey, like I've used my time wisely here. I've like changed and I've learned my lesson here is all the things that I've done and how I will be a good worker to you. Um, David, who he talked a lot about um, the importance of, especially with using redemptive narratives, also being very persuasive, right? Having the soft skills to present it, being having a co cohesive narrative, not too long, just right, and so on and so forth. So he's, um, he's talking about that process here. He says, you have to make employers feel comfortable with you being there. You gotta sell yourself in a different way with the experience from prison. You gotta make this person feel like you're not a threat because they have to basically see themselves in the work environment with you. And that's the picture I help paint as far as getting employed and doing stuff like that. And then I asked him, well, do you ever worry about um, like how they might perceive some of this stuff, right? How employers perceive some of this stuff. And he says, 
You can get a degree from Ohio State. Employers won't review it the same as Columbus State. Columbus State is a community college in Columbus. If you go to Yale, they, they're not looking at it like Kent State. Of course, they're going to take it with a grain of salt. It just depends on how you sell yourself, how you make it sound. It's not what you say, it's how you sound saying it. And it's oddly believable when you say, I can make a well done steak in eight minutes. Now that's not easy, but if you can sell that, then you're more inclined and the employer's more in tune to listen to what you gotta say, right? And so he's taking me through this process. He's acknowledging, yeah, sure, that's a potential that they may not value this, but I'm confident enough to go into that space and like prove them, right? Guys shouldn't have to do all of this to get a job, but um, that was sort of his strategy to try to do so. Um, okay, and so when things, those strategies did not always work. Um, a lot of the guys were un unemployed at the time of um, the interview, I think about 40-ish percent of the sample. Um, and, and so they had to do other things in addition to having these credentials to try to find work that wasn't just sort of any job. So 54% of the sample ended up doubling down on credentials. And what this meant was that they still used a lot of the things that they learned while they were incarcerated, but they were relying on additional credentials that they were trying to get outside in order to find work, right? So they were having to do more um, to make up for. And then they were also concerned, right? about um, their credentials sort of being marked in a way. So they wanted to pursue something on the outside, either related or something super um, more like more of interest to where they want it to be as far as career wise. Um, and so they use this approach, pursuing more education um, and training as a way to do that. And so Adriel, he was successful at this. Um, so he, he said that the employment challenges were the reason why he ended up going back to college. So he got a degree, he got uh, his associate's degree while he was incarcerated, right? And so he said, I figure I had this associate's degree, that's half a degree. I'm like, you gotta at least go for a bachelor's man. I believe in doing whole things. So I went back to school and bachelor's, he got his bachelor's degree in business, business administration. At the time of our interview, he ended up um, getting a job as a chemical dependency counselor. Um, and so he was employed and doing work that he loved and was meaningful to him. But most of the respondents, that was not the case. Um, is most of the respondents, they saw this as a viable pathway to a job like most folks do. However, um, they were encountering sort of economic barriers, um, which actually they say contributed to the cyclical nature of their incarceration. And then also the same barriers around um, access to higher education with the criminal record. Um, more work is being done on that now. But Michael, he actually, he um, took some computer programming courses while he was incarcerated. He didn't finish that because um, I think he ended up getting released. Um, and then, um, but he really loved, like that was what he wanted to go into. He, he did get a job after his release as uh, working in construction, but that was not the work he wanted to do. And so he said, I ended up trying to go back to school um, and he was saying that's, where he got some college from. Um, I went to Wilbur College for computer management because I love computers and I'm a very creative person. He said I ended up getting a student loan, but I still had to go pay a certain amount each semester, couldn't really pay that. Started back selling drugs to try to support my schooling and ended up going back to jail. After that, I was right back and forth to the penitentiary. Um, Charlie, which I sort of acknowledged earlier, um, he, I met him at a reentry fair he also went back to school and he was in the process of trying to go back to school. Um, I met him at a reentry fair and he was telling me all about that, like super excited, um, especially, you know, given I was recruiting folks there um, for this. And I met him two or met for the interview two weeks later and was asking him how that enrollment process was going. And I could just tell his whole like mood kind of shift. Um, and he started describing what was going on. He said, the school process is going okay. I mean, I have to fill out this form, which really upset me because I have to fill out this form about my felony conviction with the Office of Student Conduct. That really upsets me because why should I? You put out into the courthouse that they're accepting ex-cons at school, yet I have to stop my whole enrollment process. It stops me from taking the mass placement test because I can't um, take the mass placement, mass placement test until I've set up my account. I can't set up my account until I do this. And it was some additional paperwork. They um, may also select me and say, well, you have to go for a full review in front of the review board. Why? 
I want to just get into school and better my life. You're putting a roadblock in my way. And you start listening off all the stuff that he's done to get prepared. And then he re reiterates that you put a roadblock in my way. Um, and so guys who, you know, we preach the educational gospel who thought that, you know, that might be a way for them once they got out to improve their, their sort of economic and social conditions were then met by more barriers um, to accessing those pathways. And then the last sort of way that guys um, try to get out of these situations and find work um, was through precarious temporary type of jobs, right? Just trying to survive. So some, there were a large portion of these guys um, who did this just to survive in the meantime, right? Just to get by while they were in school or pursuing something else. Um, but there were a segment of my, there, there was a segment of my sample that actually thought that these jobs could turn into like permanent positions, right? They saw these as a way to sort of work their way up um, into a permanent position. So Bruce is an example of this. He said, a lot of these temp services, when you go to a company and the company likes your work and they ask for you back and you go back to the same job repeatedly, eventually, if they see that you're working good, they'll offer you a job. Even in a position like mine and my age, my legal history, I still have a very good shot at getting hired. But you got to get your foot in that door through a temp service, which is a lower paying, much lower paying job. And so, um, so the guys that were that thought of these jobs, um, like Bruce, none of them at the time of the interview said that they ever materialized, right? None of these positions ever materialized into the stable job. Um, like Bruce was sort of hoping for um, and, and some of the other respondents. So um, I want to end by talking about um, some of the conclusions and the implications of this work for policy um, in practice specifically, and then of course, with a little self-reflection. So I think for policy, um, based on this study and then also just having read no, I don't want to say thousand, but a lot of transcripts <laughs> of the qualitative uh, with the qualitative data. Um, I think that we've been so focused on the like front end of this process with programming and, and so on and so forth and trying to rehabilitate, like figure out what works with rehabilitating folks. Um, and for me, I see from these narratives a sort of the change that is occurring, right? How they're actually gaining um, confidence from these programs, the, the other tangible things that matter as you're sort of navigating the labor market. So for me, it doesn't so much seem like it's something like, like the content altogether, it's more on the back end, right? You could do everything right, do everything you need to do, but you need an opportunity. And so for me, that means that instead of focusing so much on the front end, um, in order for these to be as effective as it could be, that means also figuring out how do we get employers on board? Um, and, and that can be through incentives, um, but with accountability structures. So thinking of something like the work opportunity tax credit, where there's some sort of incentive, but ensuring that these workers aren't being exploited, right? So if you get a credential while you're incarcerated, having some sort of incentive for employers to then hire those folks. And I think this goes with, along with the next piece about practice. So I think this is happening more where um, there needs to be um, this building of partnerships with these external organizations. So like Cornell and these other, um, there's like another program in UT Austin, right? These external organizations um, and not just partnerships, but making it so that the credentials are then linked to those external organizations, but making that more common, right? And not just for college credentials, but also for like vocational credentials and things like that, right? You can still partner with external organizations that might also involve incentivizing some of those partnerships um, to get folks on board, um, but they're still willing, right? Like institutions, um, major college institutions can do it. There may be willing community partnerships in that regard. And then I think that also helps sets us up better for focusing on like education and training continuity. So ensuring that like you already have these built relationships, people want to continue down that path, 
right, with, with whatever credential, they might have the opportunity. So they're not trying to figure it out like Charlie and figure out all these bureaucracies of navigating this, even if it's not just you know, going directly into a program, but having sort of the resources and folks um, in a particular field with that knowledge to help folks navigate that. And then as far as for a little um, self-reflection, I think for me, it's been uh, quite a humbling and surreal experience to be able to like contribute to some of these debates um, about what works and how to rehabilitate folks um, from disadvantaged communities, just because these are the same debates that have impacted families like mine and so many other families. And so I think for me, that means um, I feel like sort of this obligation and commitment to make sure that we are viewing, even in our research and policy decisions, we're viewing um, returning citizens as producers of knowledge, right? I just use the tools that I've, you know, went seven years of grad school for, but these are their narratives, right? They are producers of knowledge and solutions um, as well. And so making sure that our research also includes the voices of those who are impacted. And then also um, for me, that means, right, through my research, it doesn't just sit behind a paywall. Um, it means that I'm elevating the voices. So this research is not just sitting behind a paywall at Wiley um, Criminology. That means I'm trying to take steps to, to engage with the public in meaningful ways, thankfully. I have an institution in, in the, um, I'm in a, a place that um, values that kind of work. And so this particular piece has gotten some coverage. Um, the Hill picked it up, which was great, right? So that public engagement, ensuring that the public is knowledgeable about this. Um, this actually um, is a newsletter that goes to about 300 um, folks who are incarcerated. And so being um, purposeful in that way, ensuring that, okay, it's not just about the public, but also like folks inside have access to some of this, what they might encounter, right, in the labor market. Not everyone knew or expected these sort of things, right? So not everyone was knowledgeable about the prison credential dilemma. Um, and then by doing this work, it has also like um, had impacts on practices, right? Um, so I've gotten some emails from practitioners who like read some of the stuff um, from the news articles um, and reached out to ask for the paper and like are wanting to institute um, some of the recommendations. And so that's been like super meaningful to me. Um, and then I think this work is even more important because we're seeing like our incarceration rates are declining at the moment. And so that means more and more people are gonna be returning um, and we want to make sure that this is not continue to be the cyclical pattern that people also, um, as more and more people are reentering their communities, that we're developing solutions that um, really make meaningful changes, especially as we continue to sort of invest in education within you know, facilities, making sure we've worked out all the kinks and, and have found ways to make these um, efforts most effective. So. Thank you all very much. And I'm excited to hear your questions. And for those that are following online, there's over 40 people online. So they're gonna put their questions in the chat. If uh, you have questions here, uh, you raise your hand and let us know because we wanna give you the microphone so the folks online can also hear the question too. And I think we had some over here. Thank you for the presentation. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Can you hear me? Um, so you started uh, the presentation with the uncertainty in the interview process, how the credentials are perceived. I wanted to kind of uh, ask you if you have given any thought to how online forums like Glassdoor, mm -hmm. um, where interviews post their experience with the interview experience can alleviate that uncertainty. Mm. So um, that's a great question. So at least, among this population, I would say um, they were just like just learning enough with online stuff to be able to apply online for jobs, right? And so I do think that could be an effective way, right? But I think it's like we have to 
we would have to do a bit more like that's too reliant on the individual to then have the skills to go seek out that knowledge. Um, I think that can be helpful, like if someone compiled a resource right um, with all of those things um, for a certain context right and then delivered it to folks, but I just am not I am not certain that um, they would have the abilities or access to consistent access to internet and things like that to go and yeah. do that type of searching. Just as a follow up, I, I think yeah, I agree with you that the uh, I, I agree with you that the skill set may not be there for the applicant to figure out uh, how to uh, figure out what's going on. But I think if we, we if we if we could put a bug in the ear of somebody at Glassdoor. And then yeah. they could say this employer you know, welcomes prisoner certification versus this employer has had negative experience or something like that. They yeah. put a flag up there that way now then every applicant can get in. So again, this is just thinking ahead, um, thinking aloud and you know, I'm sure thinking ahead as well, but uh, just, just a thought. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, company um, uh, uh, websites like Indeed um, and LinkedIn have such forums, but Glassdoor is one I think that I've heard of. So, oh, well, that's a good idea. Um, I hadn't thought about that. It didn't come up in the interviews, but I also didn't ask like that those type of questions. So that's something too for thinking about the future. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh well. Let me. Who's next? <laughs> oh, okay. So first, I just want to say thank you. This is just such wonderful and inspiring work. And I really appreciate your purposeful, practice-oriented, problem-driven approach. And I also love that you incorporated your personal experiences, because I think that's uh, so important and it resonates. And this is just the best kind of social science. So thank you. Um, my question is about... Uh, yeah, so two quick questions and I promise quick. One is, I wonder if you might say anything about race and whether that came up in the interviews mm -hmm. and whether and how that might be interacting with these kinds of experiences or the ways that, that folks are navigating employment because we know it's such a big aspect of the labor market and employment space more generally. Mm -hmm. And it's also a huge aspect of the carceral space. Mm -hmm. And we know that those intersect. And so this is bringing those together and, and it makes it difficult for me to not think and I noticed when you were describing the interviewees, you would say the name and, you know, the age and the race, right? And so, so it flags me to think, you think there's something that matters about that. And I wonder if it was mentioned explicitly in the interviews, and if so, how, how the folks that you interviewed articulated the potential importance of that or didn't. If they didn't, that's interesting as well. And then my second question, quick, is you talk about the front end and the back end. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's such a useful frame, and it's such an important part of your contribution here but you frame it as a, almost like a versus, like we spoke this a lot in the front end and yeah. now we should think about that. And I wonder how you think about, and some of this comes up towards the end when you think about, when you talk about potential policy solutions, the relationship between the front end and the back end. And one specific aspect of that I thought was whether the credential itself and the nature of the credential affected the ways, uh, the strategies that these men chose to employ, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe the narrative strategy is one you're more comfortable with if you've had a college education mm -hmm. and you're like, I know how to talk to people. I yeah. feel comfortable crafting a narrative. I feel versus if you had been in a tech a vocational space, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's when you're like, nah, I'm just going to call it the Dodge contract. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And that, and that may not be the case, right? Cause there's some that that's painting with too broad of a, of a brush in some ways, but I'm curious about whether you saw the relationship between the front end, the nature of the programming in the back end, the kinds of strategies that they took navigating the labor market and fi and figuring out the prison credential dilemma. Yeah. Um, no, both of those are great questions. So the first one, I feel like I can never do it justice, like as far as um, being able to include it, like discussions of um, race within the period of the talk, because I ended up in the piece, I actually do talk about it a little bit. So the guys didn't really explicitly mention um, race or experiencing racial discrimination, but I wasn't, my questions were very broad and they were intentionally broad. Like what's, what's been the most difficult thing about, you know, trying to find a job or whatever, like not trying to gear them toward one way or the other. However, um, in looking at the use of certain strategies, there definitely were um, differences by race. So 
black men in particular, um, and I like this is qualitative data, so I can't say whether this is you know, representative and I'm not trying to, but black men were more likely to use um, uh, the, the semblance, like the first two strategies. So omitting, trying to obscure the, um, uh, the credential being from prison, and then also um, redemptive narratives, right? And so for me, how I framed that in the article, regardless of if it's conscious or not, is that there's this element of knowing that you, you have to do a little bit more, right? So like making sure, right, you don't fit the stereotype, right? If you list the prison credential, you're a black man, that means something very different um, in that context than it does for um, a white guy who lists a, a prison credential, right? Um, you're fitting sort of the stereotype, right? And then there's the element of, in the interview, like making sure that you are really like, demonstrating right that you are remorseful you are and so they were just more likely to do that and then also there's the element of like how people find work and so some of my white respondents um, were more likely to use or be able to lean on their social networks in particular ways to find jobs even if they weren't directly related to the credential but to stay on their you know feet in the meantime and not be sort of exploited by temp work in, in the same ways um, and so I think there's that element there where because that then makes it so that um, Black and other men of color are reliant on these formal application processes where they're, they're just going to be using those skills a bit more. And then to the last question, that's not something I've looked at yet. It didn't come out as far as, uh, or the second question, it didn't come out like very explicitly about the different programs, but I do have that. And so I can look at the interviews, the strategies by that, like that could be a, another paper. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Thank you again for presenting. Really appreciate your work and the impact it's going to have. Um, I wanted to ask you if you had any participants mentioned or if you explored like the role of the parole officer for mm -hmm. um, justice impacted individuals on parole. Um, I know that for some parole officers may hinder um, employment outcomes, but yeah, but then some also Help. may try to yeah accelerate as like guidance in the employment yeah market. Yeah. Um, so yeah. No, um, that's a great question. So I think um, for the most part, these guys weren't on um, probation or parole. Um, and so they had had to like the average time since release was about five years. Like I wanted them to have enough time searching for work to have like something, some, you know, some meaningful um, contributions as far as how to how they're using these um, credentials enough time in the labor market. Um, and so a lot of them weren't on there, but like people like these guys are still very much connected to like reentry center. Like they were still trying to take advantage of a lot of the programs, but for the guys who did, I do think there's some element of, um, I'm not saying this is the best way we should be doing things, but being connected to potential resources via like a probation officer or a parole officer, um, if they're you know, good or whatever and, and well-resourced and know how to point you toward things. But then there's also the element of like, then that means like, okay, I need to find a job, right? Like you're forced to settle for certain certain types of positions, right? You constantly need to be applying to jobs. So, um, but yeah, so like it wasn't necessarily something that came up a lot just because of how I tried to make it so they had enough time looking for work after their release. Um, we're gonna turn to a question that was submitted um, online. Um, this question comes from Jackie who asks, can you speak more specifically to your recommendations about employer incentives and accountability? And are you aware of any research that exists regarding the effectiveness of existing employer incentives, such as the federal funding? Yeah, um, so I actually, that's something that came up. Okay, so to the last part of the bonding um, program. So that is something that's on my list actually, because it, I've um, started interviews with employers and I'm gonna pick back up with interviews with employers um, but some of them were concerned about like that, like liability, um, being able to bond folks. But I don't think there's actually a lot of, like a ton of research on that um, element that I know of. 
Um, oh, you were trying to get the question for, okay, I just want to make sure. And then um, secondly, I think for the first part, so the take up rates for things like work opportunity, like the work opportunity tax credit, who it allows you to get a tax credit for hiring folks um, with criminal record, a felony record, right? Those take up rates are very low, right? So we know that those aren't effective. Um, I'm not sure as far as like why, like if there's research looking at why that would probably involve something more qualitative, um, like why those things are not effective. Um, but I think that's something that's a promising strategy as far as incentivizing it. Um, and how I think of it is something like the work opportunity tax credit, where there's like this additional incentive for that's like paired with, all right, this person has a credential, you get a little, I don't know, a little bit more for, um, of a tax credit for hiring them. But then when I say incentive structures, I mean like, okay, there needs to be standards so that folks aren't exploiting those tax credits if we wanna use tax credits. I'm not saying this is the only way. Um, so like, all right, after two years, or they need to be in a position that's related to this credential, right? Certain but not so stringent that take up rates would be low, right? So that I think will take, that would take some more research to figure out what the threshold is where you get the most bang for your buck. That sounds weird, but. <laughs> I'm just wondering yeah. how your cousin Anthony is doing. And uh, what do you think um, the uh, woman helped you maybe go down a, a very different path? Uh, mm. from a background? Can you repeat the question so everybody <laughs> online hears it too? Um, yeah, so um, she asked how my cousin Anthony was doing and then um, whether being a woman would potentially lead, maybe take you down a different path. Um, and so, so my cousin Anthony is, I think he, what, he just turned like 40. I should know this off the top of my head. After about like 25, I just kind of, no. Um, but <laughs> he's, do <laughs> he's doing fine. But I think the biggest thing, like the biggest thing that he struggled with um, is housing. Um, I think that's like more and more work is being done in that area. So like he's not really been able to live independently, like always have has lived with um, my aunt. And then also he's now like employed, like stable, a bit more stable employment. But I think that's also because like he's, you know, finally, not finally, but like stop, the, the system is kind of stopped, right? So he's able to like work a job consistently without getting sort of stopped and, and wrapped back up in the system. But he's he's alive and doing like fine, but he still does have those struggles um, being able to live independently. And as far as being a woman, I think the 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 like the structural factors will be slightly different, right? So like women are more likely to have been like um, parents. Um, and, and um, sole caretakers for their children, right? That look, that that matters as far as for work, um, your ability to find jobs, your ability to go search for work, um, it looks differently. Um, and so I think the credential issue, right, would still be a, a similar problem, but the, the sort of constraints um, in their outcomes might look slightly different because of those sort of gendered factors and gender discrimination, obviously, um, and the types of programs, right, the type, of work that they might end up in. Um, so that's a quick answer to that. We got um, time for one more question. Okay. For those that put questions online, we'll copy them, send them to you. Okay. And then give you contact info so you can rely back to them. This will be the last one. We're still on. Uh, thank you uh, for this presentation, for yeah. your contribution to this field. And thank you for the way this question is on my mind. Uh, it's, it's no doubt that these prison credentials are marking documents, sort of like a PSS voucher. Field, and you know the person is poor. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, there was an interesting answer to one of your questions. The guy said that if he was applying for construction, he would not, he would not deny his calculation. And um, I was thinking that in a place that has more vocational training than educational program, your paper you cite two people that have college at your university. Right, you got two people that have college. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking that does the credential dilemma resolve itself as individuals try to move towards this menial sort of construction, auto mechanic jobs? Uh, it becomes easier for them to use those credentials and they become seen as expertise in that field. Mm -hmm. I mean, after 25 years of doing uh, plumbing, 
sort of an expert on that field, right? So does it, does it have a benefit? Mm -hmm. that the closer you move to menial sort of labor uh, intensive jobs, then as you try to go into social work or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think there actually is research showing that like, job, like construction work, right? So like, I think that, um, and even like the, my, my participant, Jeff, who had the asbestos like certificate, those jobs, like that's hazardous, right? Like these are not like, these are not jobs that, especially someone getting out, he's 60 years old, like that continue to do that, right? For, for a very long time. And, and this was something that came up with participants who I literally had, God said, I don't like getting my hands dirty like that, right? Like they wanted to do something that wasn't just using their body as labor. Um, and so, but I think the, a lot of the jobs that are accessible in that way, and there's nothing wrong with it. Like those, those jobs are growing. We need HVAC people. We, especially during a pandemic, we need um, plumbers and, and electricians, right? But that shouldn't be like the only sort of option that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I do, like there would be differences, I think. Um, and that's something that hopefully someone will test. So I can, um, but yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. Let's uh, thank Dr. Shadi Lindsay for the time. And the wonderful presentation, everybody, thank you for joining us online. Thank you for joining in person. If you're joining in person, we do have lunch for you outside. You can grab that and go. And thank you so much for attending.